Right, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here to the, to the, uh, in the press conference room here in the Dalian International Convention Centre. It's the first issue briefing of this year's annual meeting of the new champions. It's a very, very interesting, topical and timely subject. It's, a, it's also an emotive subject. It is, of course, artificial intelligence. The purpose of this session, of course, is to invite as many questions from the floor as possible. We're also curating questions from our social media audience, and I'd like to say a very warm welcome to our audience watching us live on weforum.org. My name is Oliver Kahn. I work for the forum. I'm proud and, and pleased to be joined by Rodney Brooks, the founder and chairman and CTO of Rethink Robotics, a manufacturer, and of course, Stuart Russell, professor at the University of California in Berkeley, USA, both experts in their own right. I'm going to start the um, session off by just asking a, a brief question to both. And Stuart, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Was Elon Musk right when he said that AI poses the greatest existential threat to mankind? That's a great question. Let, let me try to unpack a little bit what uh, Elon was saying. So, so first of all, Elon is a very brilliant guy, um, and people take what he says uh, very seriously. Um, he had recently read a book by Nick Bostrom called Superintelligence, which talks about uh, the long-term question of AI, which is what happens if we succeed in creating general-purpose superhuman intelligence, which means systems that can make decisions uh, that are much more uh, accurate than those made by humans, that take into account more information, that look further in ahead into the future. And so very roughly, you can, you can think of it as a little bit like uh, playing chess with a machine. We all understand that machines can uh, defeat us very easily at chess uh, because they can look further ahead into the future and they're more accurate. Uh, and now just extend from the chessboard to the entire world. Uh, you don't really want to be ch playing chess against a superintelligent machine with the world at stake. Uh, so this is the question that Elon is, is talking about. Um, but I think the way it's been uh, portrayed is that, uh, number one, it's, it's described as if he's talking about the present. Uh, he's not talking about the present, he's talking about the, the distant future. Uh, it's very hard to say how far away that future is because to reach that level of uh, capability in machines uh, requires quite a few conceptual breakthroughs, and those are very hard to predict uh, when they will take place. The other thing that people are misunderstanding, perhaps, is that uh, when he's saying this is potentially uh, a risk to humanity, um, it's a little bit like saying that, uh, you know, the, uh, as H.G. Wells did in 1912, uh, that the creation of atomic weapons would be a risk to humanity, and that was certainly right. Um, but it wouldn't make sense in 1912 to say, oh, then, you know, we, we better stop doing physics. Uh, and that's the, the lesson that people are taking from, uh, from what Elon is talking about, that perhaps we should stop doing AI because at some point in the distant future, uh, success in a certain kind of, of AI and general purpose intelligence might pose a threat. Um, but what, the way I interpret what Elon is saying is posing a challenge, that if the AI community is working full steam ahead, trying to create general purpose intelligence, then it's the job of the AI community to understand how to make sure that the systems we build remain completely under our control. Uh, and at the moment, I would say the AI community has not put enough thought into the question of what if we succeed. Uh, also respond. Um, uh, Stuart mentioned uh, chess playing as an example, and I think that illustrates a, an important distinction that many people outside the field of AI uh, don't make. Inside the field of AI, we make it, but it's so natural to us, we don't necessarily feel we have to explain it. And that's the difference between performance and competence. So a chess playing program has very high performance. And today's chess, you know, in the, in the 90s, I, IBM's Deep Blue beat the world chess champion. Today you can get any number of programs run on a laptop that are better chess players than any human being in history. So they have very high performance, but they don't have the competence that would come when a person plays at that level. A person who is a chess master can teach someone else how to play chess better. Those programs can't teach how to play chess better. A person who's a chess master knows that there's a lot of psychology 
in playing chess. Uh, those those uh, chess programs don't know that. Those chess programs aren't aware that people exist. Those chess programs aren't aware they're playing a game. They can't play tic-tac-toe. They can't generalize. Recently, and I think this has sort of spurred people on, deep learning, uh, a technical t form, um, a technique, a technique, has been very, very successful. More successful than I think five years ago most AI researchers would have predicted uh, at a couple of tasks. Uh, one is for speech understanding for the low level uh, sp uh, uh, decomposition of speech signals and so our speech understanding systems have gotten much better. And secondly, the, the very popular um, um, demonstration is in image labeling. And there was a story in the New York Times not so long ago showing how these programs could label images. And the, the, the example they show uh, there is um, some people playing Frisbee, and the system says this is a group of people playing Frisbee. But if a person can label that image, they can ask a answer a lot of other questions about that image that the programs can't. They can ask, answer how many people in the image. It happens to be three. The programs can't answer that. What, where's the Frisbee? Can't answer that. What is a Frisbee? Can't answer that. Who is interacting with the Frisbee just recently or in the future? Can't answer that. Who is looking at who? Can't answer that. These are things that a person that could label that image would understand about the biggest story around Frisbee. Instead, with deep learning, it's just able to give that label. And I think that makes people like Elon Musk mistakenly assume that we have superhuman intelligence level coming almost immediately. And I think that's probably a long, 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 long way off. Uh, and, and, and Rodney, I wanted to uh, broach that, that risk subject early on because uh, I wanted to now come to you. And, and as a manufacturer of robots that generally do nice things, helpful things, you've said um, recently in the, in the media that this year, as a, as a producer of robots, is going to be a, 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 a tipping point as such, a, a knee in the curve in the industry's growth, I believe. Tell us a bit more about what's happening on the ground, and from a, maybe from a business perspective. Well, in my particular case, my, my company is uh, building robots to go into manufacturing. Um, they, um, the traditional robots we've had before have been dangerous, and you have to put walls around them, cages around them and they're very difficult to program. So what we've done is try to build a robot that it's safe to be this close to, just as I am, you know, uh, Stuart is safe from me, uh, um, and that it's easy to get to do a task. And they are going into manufacturing in, in the US, we've been having them for about three years, now putting them in Europe and in China. People often say to me, how could you want robots in China for manufacturing? But as many of you probably know, that manufacturers in China are having a lot of problem getting enough labor. They, they, the re recruitment and retention are the two biggest problems for manufacturing in China. China has an incredible, incredible advantage over the rest of the world because it has this amazing supply chain that's been built up over the last 30 years. So manufacturing is not going to go to Africa or somewhere else where there may be more population. It's going to stay in China, but just, you know, with Wages have been going up 15% per year in, in China, so it's not like wages have been held down in manufacturing, but people, uh, there's not enough people who want those jobs, and so there's a real demand for automation and robotics for those to, to, uh, to uh, uh, maintain China's lead in electronics and other manufacturing. Okay, let's just get a sense of who, um, who, who has any questions at this stage. Okay, so let's go to the lady here in the front row, please. Could you give us your name and your affiliation, please, and, uh, and also mention who you would like to answer your question. Please don't make it me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Uh, Yan Qing from China Business News. Uh,中国经济经商报的, 最新的边界是哪儿
在英国看到这样的电视，好像机器人会有人感知。嗯，好，我先来回第二个问题吧。关于真机器人的机器的感觉，但是我们现在还不知道。如果有人说告诉你，呃，他会有感觉，这不是真的。那么很简单的讲，这个最呃神经科学、哲学方面呢，这种感知都是一个非常复杂的问题。我们如何，如果能够说能够建立，呃，我没有这样的一个理论基础。来说，一个机器啊，我会有这样的感知，但是尽、呃、尽管如此呢，呃，也不太完全清楚啊，到底它是有多大的重要性。但是、呃，如果你要看像这个机器人呢、啊，这个电影啊，呃，在电影中啊，年轻人，呃，他有一个机器人。推出的机器人呢？它是否真的让机器人它有这样的感知呢？嗯、呃，现在还不太清楚，也是否重要。那么，在很多情况，它对机器人就像对人一样的这种反应，要做出同样的行为。So whether we treat robots as if they're conscious will depend, to a large extent, I think, on how the robots look and how they behave,、uh, and the question of whether they are actually conscious. Uh, it may remain a mystery, and in some ways, it remains a mystery for us. You don't know for sure that I'm conscious, right? You just make that assumption because I look like you and I behave like you, and you know that you're conscious, and so you you guess that I am.、Um, and so that's the state of the art in consciousness science right now: is I know I'm conscious, and I guess you are. That's about as much as we know.、Um, Well, why the question matters? Because if the machine can have conscious one day, they will control human being, and now the other way around. That's the、uh, core of the question, I think. Okay, so so I think this is an important thing to get straight: the ability of a machine to control the world or control the human race has nothing to do with consciousness whatsoever. Okay, the the. The ability of a machine to control the world or to beat me at chess has to do with its ability to make good decisions, to make decisions that achieve its own objectives.、Uh, that doesn't require consciousness. Chess programs are not conscious, but they make much better decisions than I do. Okay, and there's absolutely no reason to think that we require consciousness for machines to make good decisions in general,、uh, in terms of their their interactions with humans and and their ability to control the physical world.、Um, So、uh, the only real question that consciousness raises is the question of should we accord rights to robots? If there if there arises a movement, if a large part of humanity believes that machines are conscious, they will be calling for machines to have rights. At the moment, machines don't have any rights、uh, any more than cars have rights.、Uh, so that's the that's the one question where it makes a difference, and we may have philosophers and lawyers arguing about this for centuries、uh, without reaching any conclusion. I'll come back to consciousness in a minute, I, but I want to answer your first question.、Um, you talked about perception, action, and cognition, and、um, I'm going to talk about each of those in turn.、Um, research on perception is going exceedingly well right now, and part of that is driven by video, the video game industry. The video game industry has made 3D cameras very low cost. And with 3D cameras being low cost, it means researchers at any university in the world can now work on 3D vision. And when you go to a, a computer vision conference or a robotics conference, there are many, many, many papers about trying to understand cluttered scenes, where the, you know, the sort of scenes that happen in real life, where there's lots of stuff there. Now they're working differently than a person. They're labeling. They're not understanding the. Function of the objects they label in the same way that a person labels them, but nevertheless, it doesn't matter. In some sense, it's going to lead to a lot better robots. On the action side, we of course have robots that can can move on wheels well. We don't have them doing that well on walking yet. And the thing that's closest to my、uh, heart is dexterous manipulation. We've been working on that for over 40 years in robotics and AI, and the robot hands we can build today are really not much better than they were 40 years ago. We have not made 
very good progress with that. It's a bit, this, this thing that we each have two of are amazing, amazing devices. And in order to make progress on them, you need to make progress on four things at once. You need to make progress on um, materials because our hands do a lot of what they do because of the material properties of our skin. You need to make um, progress on, on sensing within the skin, which is hard for us to figure out how to do and video games haven't helped us there. You need to have complex mechanisms because we have so many degrees of freedom and you need new algorithms and you sort of need all four moving together at once and that's been very hard to get research teams funded to work on. So dexterous manipulation, we're not doing very well and walking, um, Cognition, we have systems which can plan better and Moore's law has been very, very good to planners, just faster computers have meant algorithms have gotten a lot better. My own experience is it's very hard to get people in industry to want to adopt programs that make decisions through planning by themselves. They want the machine to do the same thing every time. They don't want it to, to be better sometimes than other times. So getting that out there is a, is a, is a challenge and requires a different way of thinking. We're all used, with our, with our smartphones, we're all used to the software sort of automatically being updated and getting better. But in, t in industry, that's not the way people are thinking at the moment. They don't like to lose that element of control. Getting to consciousness, will we ever have conscious machines? I think I'm a machine. I am a machine. I'm, I don't think there's anything else. It's just biomolecules, biomolecules working under physical principles. So I think we have an existence proof that machines can be conscious. I think we have no idea what consciousness means, except our own perceptions of it, as, as Stuart says. And I, I, think, uh, I think it's going to be a long time before we, we do. And the, the last point is you, you, got, you went from consciousness to control. I created a, a bunch of intelligent machines, and those intelligent machines sort of got a little annoyed with me, and they uh, you know, thought they knew better than me, uh, but they didn't try to kill me. My four children still love me. Um, <laughs> so I don't know why everyone thinks just because you have a smart machine that it's going to hate people. I mean, my children don't hate me, and they're machines. That's a common uh, idea that, that uh, the machine will suddenly wake up uh, and decide that it doesn't like people. Uh, that's not really the issue. The, the issue is how do you put a purpose into a machine, an objective, such that when the machine, which is by assumption more intelligent, more capable than we are, when it chooses what to do to achieve that objective, we want to still be sure that the actions it takes are ones that we are happy with. And, you know, King Midas, uh, a long time ago, he's a famous figure in, in mythology, um, he asked uh, for a special power, which is that everything he touched should turn to gold. And what happened, of course, was he got what he wanted, and his water turned to gold, his family turned to gold, his food turned to gold, and he died of starvation and thirst and misery. He got exactly what he asked for, and then it wasn't what he wanted. So um, there's a famous paper by Norbert Wiener, who's a very uh, brilliant mathematician from the 20th century, uh, written in 1960, and he said, if you put a purpose into a machine, you had better be absolutely sure that the purpose is really the one that you desire. It's very difficult to be certain of that when the machine is going to carry out this purpose, it's going to come up with plans that never occurred to you as a human being uh, as being ways of achieving that purpose. So this, I think, is the core of the problem that Elon Musk is talking about, that Nick Bostrom is talking about, that other people are talking about, is when machines do things in ways that you don't expect, you still want to be sure that you're happy with the results. Uh, and how do we make that happen? That's a really difficult question. Uh, Fortunately, at the moment, it's not immediately urgent because the machines are not that smart. Uh, you know, chess programs just play chess moves. They're not in the taking over the world business. Um, but it's hard to predict when those breakthroughs will occur. And 
Uh, I always like to give an example from history, which is in nuclear physics. Uh, so Ernest Rutherford was the leading nuclear physicist in the world, just as Rod is one of the leading roboticists in the world. Uh, and in, um, in 1933, on the 11th of, sep of September, he gave a famous speech where he said that uh, essentially we will never find ways of extracting energy from atoms. The next morning, uh, Leo Zillard, another physicist, read about this speech and invented the nuclear chain reaction. Uh, and a few months later patented the nuclear reactor uh, and described how a nuclear weapon would work. So the prediction that something is a long, 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 long way off in the future, Rutherford said it would never happen. And it, in fact, it happened in less than 24 hours. So it's a little bit difficult to make these predictions of when those breakthroughs will occur. Uh, I think in AI, we're somewhat further away. We need more than one breakthrough, maybe four, five, six, it's hard to say. Um, but I, I do think that we need a lot more work on understanding how to put the right purpose into a machine so that we like the results. I'll just respond to, to, to Stuart there. Um, I think he and I disagree somewhat here. Uh, I interpret the way Stuart talks as we have the current world and then we have this machine whose purpose we don't quite know very well. Um, but in reality, technology doesn't happen that way. So before we have a machine which does something really bad to us, we'd have a machine that was quite, quite angry and annoying. And before that, we'd have machines which were slightly annoying. And so I think we will have a, a process of evaluating what we want. It won't just suddenly appear all at once. In a, in a sense, nuclear bombs did appear at once, but with $3 billion of $1940 investment and, and thousands of people working on it in a war situation where it could be, where it was kept secret. But, um, um, I think uh, these these sorts of things. It, once we don't have any machines with any purpose at the moment, in any desires or goals, we don't have any. Not even in labs. They have, objecti they have objectives. They have That's objectives. the point. That's what we mean by purpose. Is simply the machine has some objective which it is supposed to optimize. That's all it means. Uh, you but, know, and this but, is this. But, coming from out of the sky and suddenly the super, super smart machine. It's going to come gradually, as we've seen with self-driving cars. Self-driving cars didn't suddenly get on the road. It's, a, it's been a long process since 1988, we were talking about earlier this morning, and still they're not out there. And still, we're pretty sure they're not quite good enough yet to, to let go on the roads. A lot of effort into getting the right panel here because we want them to have a bit of a friss on and and, and, and bang against each other. We sound like we, we sound like we have the same accent, even though we come from opposite sides of the world. Uh, I just want to put a, a shameless plug in for our issue briefing at, eight, at six thirty this evening, which will actually have some neuro neuroscientists. So you can ask them about memory implant and uh, and and those kind of consciousness questions then, and hopefully we'll get even more, um, you know, a wider, more diverse array of answers to that one. Any more questions from the floor? Okay, well, let's, uh, okay, lady over there, perfect. Uh, thank you. M my name is Ju Xiaoting from Xinhua News Agency. Uh, Xinhua News Agency, this is a state media of China. Uh, my question is about um, what if uh, the artificial intelligence grow into a different thinking pattern that we cannot understand, that we cannot communicate with them? For example, we have, um, uh, uh, the artificial neural networking. People put things into them, and they they can um, they can in intimate the uh, uh, the 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 humans handwriting. But but you cannot change the handwriting if you not satisfied with uh, some part of it because you don't know which line of uh, their expressions is slightly different. You, you, you can't talk to them actually. You, you, cannot, you can just educate them. You cannot directly change them. What if the artificial intelligence think in a totally different way that we cannot communicate with them? We Thank have, you. I think we have some examples right now. We're not sure how intelligent dolphins are. We don't know whether dolphins are conscious. We, we, we're not good at understanding, you know, and our, our understanding of 
animal cognition is changing rather rapidly right now um, compared to where it was uh, very recently. I think the, the point you make about artificial neural networks, um, one of the things that, that gets back to my point before, but the difference between performance and competence, if a human has a certain level of performance, they have a competence which includes some ability to explain what they're doing or at least to rationalize what they're doing. Most of our AI systems do not have that yet, which leads me to think that they are, sorry, Stuart, a long, 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 long way from consciousness. Uh, I think this is, this is a good question, and I, my own research actually uh, is, is in methods that are somewhat different from artificial neural networks, uh, where they are, uh, in some sense, inspectable. You can understand uh, what it is the system knows, uh, and uh, you can actually ask it questions about what it believes and why it believes that. Uh, with, with a neural network technology, it really is a black box. I mean, you have a system with 100 million uh, elements, uh, and each of those elements is adjusted in, in various directions. Uh, the, the parameters are changed. Um, and so if you look at the Google Vision systems, for example, that are, that are quite good at recognizing different categories of objects, how they do it, um, nobody knows. All we know is they do it pretty well, um, in many ways as well as a human being can, uh, given the same uh, examples. Uh, They've done some little experiments where they, uh, they look at, uh, they call it dreaming, um, where you can have the system sort of generate images from its own internal circuits. Uh, and then you look at some of those images and they look funky. They look weird. They have you know, eyeballs on stalks and, and strange creatures, which are mixtures of lions and cats and dogs and, and so on. Um, but that's about as much as we know, that there, there are some internal uh, subparts of this large network that, that, that perhaps describe different parts of objects and somehow they're combined and mixed together to, to, uh, to do recognition. But um, so if, if you're concerned about uh, making sure that the, that the machine is going to behave in predictable uh, ways, um, this may not be the best technology to achieve that. I want to, um, we're rapidly running out of time, but I just want to get a couple more questions in, if I may. And I'm going to go back to one of your comments you made earlier about the community not really putting enough thought into the, the risks. And what can we do to future-proof this situation? Is, is regulation of, of this industry, this science, possible? Because uh, by people writing on, on whiteboards and writing mathematical formulae, you know, you can't pass a law saying, you know, as soon as you get to, you know, alpha plus, you've got to stop right there in the middle of the equation. You can't go any further. Um, so, uh, but regulation could at some point be applied. For example, if you're going to put a trading system into the stock market, it might be reasonable that that trading system satisfies certain properties so that we know it cannot destabilize the market in the way uh, that has happened in the so-called flash crash, which was a result of algorithms that were not particularly well designed interacting with each other in ways that uh, nearly destabilized the real economy. Um, and it was only because they, they built in circuit breakers that essentially stop trading on the stock market and then unwind all those trades uh, that they managed to rescue the real economy from what would have been a big disaster. So it would seem entirely reasonable that uh, either by self-regulation or by legislation, uh, trading algorithms on the stock market should satisfy certain properties that prevent those kinds of runaway behaviors. Um, you could imagine later on with self-driving cars, uh, we would want, again, the same kind of um, assurances that uh, those cars have been properly designed, the algorithms are properly designed so that they know how to react. Just like we have, you know, we have driving tests for humans now uh, before they're allowed to go out on the road. Uh, we may need something, a more mathematical kind of test, to show that a self-driving car does the right thing. In the longer term, um, it's much more difficult because we don't know the shape of the AI systems uh, that we'll see in 20 or 30 years' time, um, what kind of regulation would make sense. The other thing uh, that we can do to future-proof is actually to change the way we educate the engineers in the field. 
Uh, I think at the moment, in, if you look at civil engineering, the idea that a civil engineer would design a bridge without thinking about safety at all is completely bizarre. I mean, the whole no the meaning of the word bridge means something that you can walk on without fa without it falling down. Um, but the same is not true for software and AI software. Um, so there needs to be a change in the culture of the field so that when we build intelligent systems, we are thinking about their effects on humans and making sure that uh, they are safe and predictable. Uh, and that requires uh, building in those things into the education system. Very briefly, if you, if yeah. you can. I, I agree completely that we can't regulate science uh, that, that, because we don't know what's going to be good and what's going to be bad. Um, regulating um, deployed systems, absolutely. I disagree somewhat uh, with the emphasis that Stuart puts on mathematical proof. I think that's going to be very difficult. We've had horses in our societies for thousands of years. We had no mathematical proof of what they would do, but we had a general understanding of their performance characteristics. We knew don't stand right behind a, to a horse. We knew don't light a match next to a horse's eye. So we knew the parameters under which horses were generally safe. And if a particular one was a real problem, they were culled from the herd and gotten rid of. So I think that will be. Uh, more how many of us. A lot of laws were written around horses and how, how yeah. they could be uh, uh, controlled. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Not, no mathematical it's proofs. Yeah. Okay. Things off, because this, this is what we do at the forum. We look at opportunities and challenges. Could you both, and looking not too, not too far into the future, but both give us the, your, your greatest opportunity and the greatest risk in the coming year or two from artificial intelligence? <laughs> in as few words as possible. Uh, it takes me that long to get through my email. Um, so I, I think uh, one of the things I'm most excited about is uh, the potential for progress in understanding language um, and that we will move, not in, not in a year or two, but, but in let's say uh, five to ten years, uh, we'll move from the current generation of search engines which uh, index the web but don't understand anything. Uh, to systems that in, in some limited ways can understand everything that they read. Uh, a system that has read essentially everything that the human race has ever written uh, and extracted information from it and synthesized that uh, could be ten times more valuable to human society than search engines have been. And search engines have been uh, a very valuable addition to our civilization. Uh, so I'm very excited about that possibility. Uh, in terms of risks, uh, this is a risk in the next year or two, is the development of autonomous weapons um, where nations and companies are moving quite rapidly towards the capabilities for, uh, for robots to be used in warfare uh, in ways that are not directly under human control. Uh, and I know that uh, the Chinese ambassador, for example, at the United Nations in Geneva has expressed grave concern about these possibilities, as has uh, the Japanese ambassador, the German ambassador, and the Vatican. The Pope is uh, strongly opposed to autonomous weapons. So this is a question where we need some serious uh, policy discussions, and it has to be done soon, because otherwise there'll be an arms race, uh, and it'll be very hard to get back to the status quo from that. Um, in terms of opportunities, I think the opportunities in Europe, in North America, and China uh, around the aging population uh, in all those societies, Ch of course Japan, in all those societies there's been a, there's a demographic inversion going on, not enough younger people to look after older people. So uh, AI and robotic systems which let individuals maintain control of their lives longer. I put the, the uh, uh, driver assist technology as an example of that. In, uh, it lets people drive as they get older, longer than they would without those driver assist technologies, so it lets them keep their independence. I think there's going to be a tremendous pull in, across Europe, Asia, and North America for technologies which let the elderly maintain their lifestyle and their independence longer. My big fear is there won't be enough robots. Okay, what a, that's the, the risk is not enough robots are being manufactured. What a fascinating session. We could be here all day, I'm sure, but we'll have other meetings and appointments to get to. Thanks so much, gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure having you here for our first issue briefing of the morning. Thank you all 
for joining us. We're actually here, right back here in 10 minutes, till talking about the digital transformation of industries and looking at how the digital revolution is transforming society in ways that we're not even aware of. So I hope you can join us. But for the time being, this session is now closed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.